My name is Edward Perry. I'm from Houston, Texas, uh, originally from Massachusetts. I grew up on the South Shore. Um, after I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Miami, Florida, uh, and then uh, after college, I moved to Houston. I lived there for about the last 13 years. Um, you can find me online. There's my email address if you have questions after this, you want to get in touch. Uh, also on Instagram or on Twitter at the Ed Perry or on LinkedIn at uh, Ed Tech. I am um, big time outdoorsman, fish, hunt, camp, all of that fun stuff. Um, I'm also a proud and devoted alumni of the University of Miami. Spend a lot of time there, um, a lot of time giving back to the university as well working with mentorship programs and as well as their on-campus marketing startup. Um, this is my dog, Callie. She is my uh, fur baby. And uh, the two of us travel together full-time in the new headquarters for my business, which is this RV right here. Um, we've been mobile for almost three years now and uh, decided to step things up a bit. So now I'm towing a trailer. This is the new company headquarters as well as my humble abode and it allows me to be seasonally location independent. So I spend my summers up here in Massachusetts enjoying the nice weather. And then as soon as it starts to get crappy, I go back down to Florida. And then uh, as soon as it gets to be too many old people in Florida, I move back over to Texas for a little while. And then in springtime, I just kind of drift. So it's kind of nice. Um, running a business that exists only online allows me to do that. And I try to give back to the WordPress community whenever I can because WordPress was really the thing that allowed me to get to where I am now. Uh, we started just doing websites. We're now a full-service marketing, advertising, and technology agency. But it all started with uh, my buddy coming to me saying, hey, um, my girlfriend is a designer. She's working with this restaurant, and they have a website that needs help. Can you help us? I didn't know what I was getting into. I said yes, and one thing led to another, and here I am. So um, it's been a really interesting journey, but everywhere that I've been throughout the United States, I've been able to meet really amazing people through the WordPress community. So the one thing I would suggest um, just outside of all of the technology stuff with the WordPress community is if you get the opportunity to go outside of Massachusetts and go to a WordPress meetup or go to a WordCamp, do it because it's a really great experience. The community is extremely gracious and welcoming and helpful. Um, it's not like a lot of professions where people are very secretive and cutthroat. I find the WordPress community to be extremely open and sharing and, uh, and just helping people. Um, we're all just, I think, warm-hearted people that like to give back. So uh, that would be my two cents on the WordPress community. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about how to implement, really quickly, how to implement Google Analytics, kind of a crash course on that. And then I want to focus the majority of our time on what to do once you get that set up. Um, I think a lot of people are like, yeah, you have to have Google Analytics, but then when it comes down to it, it's like, all right, so I have it, now what do I do with it? Um, it can be daunting. There's a lot of reports, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of buzzwords in there, and if you don't know what those things mean, it can get overwhelming quickly. So, um, To start, I'm going to talk a little bit about Google's new thing, the marketing platform. Uh, as, as Google likes to do, they rebrand and repackage things. So in the, the most recent iteration of this, they've changed it to now what's called the Google Marketing Platform, which is all of these wonderful tools that you see here. So Display and Video 360 is um, advertising. Search Ads 360 is also advertising, and that's enterprise level. Analytics is still Analytics, but Analytics 360 is the enterprise version of that. Data Studio is a, like a business intelligence tool where you can put data together and create cool graphs and fun stuff, which is actually a lot of fun. If you like data like I do, I'm a huge data nerd. But if you enjoy that stuff, Data Studio is like a sandbox playground of wonders. It's amazing. Um, Optimize 360 is ad optimization using A-B testing and automation. And then over there, Survey 360 is Survey Monkey Killer. Uh, Google's trying to take over that industry as well, so they've made their own survey tool. And then Tag Manager, which is one of my all-time favorite Google tools because it makes adding marketing tags to websites so much easier. So. Um, Let's start with Google Analytics. So if you have a client that's like, hey, I need analytics, I need to understand who my customers are, or maybe they didn't specifically say that, but you know that that client has a, a lack of definition in their audience and you need to fix that. One of the ways that you can do that is by looking at who's spending time on their website now. And then if you're gonna do advertising, you could take that information and either create a lookalike audience or you can retarget those people after they've been cookied, or there's lots of interesting things you can do once a person has visited your site and you know who they are. 
Uh, a lot of what I do in putting together marketing funnels for different businesses is trying to get people to the website just so that we can track them. Even if it's not to convert them the first time, it might be to convert them the second time or the third time or the fourth time by showing them an ad, remarketing them on Facebook, then remarketing them again on YouTube six weeks later, then sending them an email or putting an automation queue together that sends a drip campaign. There's lots of different combinations, but it all starts with understanding who those people are, how they're interacting with your website. Another thing that's really interesting about Google Analytics is it shows you behavior. And I think human behavior is really, really interesting. So I get lost sometimes going down the rabbit hole just trying to figure out why people are doing something. Why is everybody visiting this page and dropping off right here? What is causing that particular behavior? So to get started with all of this, you want to create an account at Google Analytics. So analytics.google.com. Create an account. That's free. You can use any Google account. It does not have to be a Gmail account. If you already have a work email address and you want to use that as a Google account, you can actually do that. It doesn't have to be Gmail. Um, <clears throat> then you would uh, create your account, create a property, which is essentially a website. You'll put in a website address for that, for whatever property you're doing. Then you'll create a view. A view is a particular set of data and how you're slicing that up and viewing that particular chunk of traffic information. And then that's going to create a or excuse me, an analytics account ID, which I'll show you how to get in just a second. You're going to save that. And then you're going to jump over to Google Tag Manager. So Google Tag Manager is a tool that allows you to put snippets of code into your website really easily without having to change the code more than once. Essentially, if you imagine Google Tag Manager as this magic container that you can put tracking codes into, as many as you want to. You only have to touch the website once to implement Tag Manager, and then from inside the Tag Manager platform, you can plug in the Facebook pixel, the LinkedIn Insights pixel, you can put in Google Analytics remarketing pixels, you can put in any number of different codes that you're using for different marketing tools to track people, track behavior, track events, track page loads, whatever it may be, without having to keep putting more and more code into the website. Basically, Tag Manager takes care of that for you. So if you are not a developer, if you're just a marketing agency, you can have somebody implement Tag Manager on a WordPress website for you once, and then without any code knowledge, you can put as many marketing or retargeting tags as you need to in the Tag Manager without having to go back and change the code on the site over and over again. So if that's confused anybody, please feel free to come talk to me later. I'll be happy to show you a little bit more of that. I'll show you briefly what that looks like. Essentially, you create an account. Once you've created your account, you create a container. So that's the, the tag holder where you're going to put your tags. Then you can create a tag. The first one that you would want to create is obviously going to be Google Universal Analytics, which is what we're going to talk about here tonight. Then you would create a trigger. So you would say every time a page loads, load this tag for me. So that way anytime anybody visits any page of that website, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, if you put in the wildcard, it will track that load and send the signal back to Google Analytics saying, hey, a thing happened. Pay attention to that. Um, so you create the trigger, you add your ID in so it knows to associate with that Google Analytics account, you publish the tag, check it, and then make sure it's working correctly. So let's talk about what that looks like, shall we? So here's Google Tag Manager. This is the Tag Manager logo up here in the top left. It's this uh, diamond blue thing here. If you have, like me, many accounts, they'll all be stored up here and you can view all the different properties and things. Right now we're actually looking at my agency's website account. We don't get a ton of traffic, but we get enough that it'll be useful for this conversation anyways. Um, when you get in here, you'll see workspace changes. Workspace are different areas that you can use for running different types of tests. For most people, if they're just doing basic implementation, you would just have a single workspace and you can put as many tags as you need to in that workspace. If you're doing split testing and things like that, you might have a use case for multiple. Or if you have two different teams working on two different campaigns, they might have different workspaces. So it just kind of depends. Um, but for most use cases, you just have a single workspace and then you make the tags in there. So the way that works is over here on the left side is tags. I click on tags. And these are the tags that are currently loading on my website. So if I wanted to add a new one, I would click this new button here in the top right hand corner and I get an untitled tag. So this is just gonna be new tag for now. And then when you click on the edit button for the tag, you get Google stuff here as pre-built options where you can just authenticate and it will work for you. And then there's custom options and things like this down here. And then Google partners show up in the more section below that. 
You'll notice that Facebook's not in here because obviously Facebook and Google don't get along. So if you're trying to put in the Facebook pixel, you need to do it with this one here, which is custom HTML. And you just put in a custom HTML tag and just paste the Facebook pixel code into that. LinkedIn also? Yeah, LinkedIn also. That's not in here. So we're doing Google Analytics. That's a Google product. So that's an easy one. So you would just collect Google Analytics here. Track type is going to be page view, unless you're trying to track a specific event. But for most things, you just want to see what pe pages people are going to. Page view will work. Uh, any variables. If you don't have a variable, you create, click a new variable here. This is where you would put in the tracking ID from your Google Analytics account. So we're going to come back to this in just a second. I want to jump back over to Google Analytics now to show you where you would get that information. So in Google Analytics, you create your account, you sign in, you get to Google Analytics, the home page. Again, if you've got multiple accounts, those accounts are stored up here by account, property, or app, and then views within that. When you get into accounts, if you go down here to admin in the bottom left-hand corner, this is where the settings are. Get in the settings, and then we're going to go over here to property. Third option down is tracking info, right here. And then there's an option that says tracking code. So we click on tracking code. This will load eventually. Okay, this is my tracking ID right here. UA stands for Universal Analytics, which is the latest iteration of Google Analytics. Um, you would copy this code here, go back over to Tag Manager, and paste that whole tag in the ID in there. Cookie domain can be set to auto. That's the default. It will be pre-filled for you. And then you would hit save. Uh, you give this a variable name, whatever you want for that really. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to save this for now because I already have one. After you've set up your tag and the variable, you're going to go down here to triggering. <coughs> Click on this little edit pen here in triggering. And we're going to say, I want this to trigger on all pages every time there's a page view. Okay. So what that means is when a page is fully rendered, it's now loaded, that's considered a view. And this is important, so uh, take note of that for a second. We'll come back to that later. So what we've set here is now a trigger. So this is telling it, here's the tag I want you to fire. The trigger is when do you fire said tag. So again, I'm not going to save that, but you would if you wanted. We're creating a new tag. Discard these changes for now. So now I've created a tag. It would take me back to the home page. <laughs> and now I can preview or I could submit. If I want to test to make sure that it's working, what I do is hit preview. This page will reload. And you see this Google Tag Manager bar that just appeared at the bottom. And now I have this orange bar that says now previewing workspace. So if I go to Beacon Agency in uh, incognito window, you won't see it. But here's my website, right? Loading normally. If I go to in not in it, oops. In the same window as Google Tag Manager, because it's in preview mode, what it's doing now is it's showing the Tag Manager bar on my website and showing me all the tags that fired on the page across the bottom there. So we see the summary here. So this is where you can actually confirm if your tag was set up correctly and if it's working. If you put it in there, you set publish and then you hit the preview button, you should see the tag fire here at the bottom. If you don't see that, something is configured incorrectly. So this is how you test your work. Once you're done with that, you can just hit preview up here or you can leave preview mode here. That will take you out of preview mode so that the next time you go back and reload your website, the tag manager bar will be gone. Everything is back to normal. Okay. So now we know that the Google Tag Manager tag has been implemented. Now we can start doing the fun stuff, which is looking at the analytics. So any questions so far before we jump into that part? Everybody good on the crash course on implementation? I know, the preview button and you got to that. Yeah, so preview takes you into what's essentially the test mode where that bar shows up at the bottom. And then you just navigate in the same browser window to your website, reload the page, and the, the preview thing will show up at the bottom again. Like that. Cool. Any other questions? If you want a more detailed explanation of how to do that, there's tons of stuff online. And that's kind of why I decided to just do a crash course and not really spend a lot of time on it. There's tons of YouTube videos with screen captures and people showing you step by step 
There are Google, or excuse me, there's WordPress plugins that make the implementation really easy. You just paste the container ID into a plugin basically and it does the implementation part for you. So if you need more help or you just want to learn more about Tag Manager, just do a little bit of Google search, check out YouTube, check out some of like WP Beginners got some great resources on that. There's some other marketing websites and things that have detailed explanations. So, uh, and also just feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions on it too. So once you've got it all set up and all the analytics stuff is firing correctly, then you get to go back into analytics and this is where the real fun begins. So when you land on the homepage for Google Analytics, you're looking at what's just essentially a dashboard and an overview of everything that's going on in your website. Um, if you would, if you have a device in front of you, whether it's a mobile device or your laptop, if you just go to beacon.agency right now and just load that page for me real quick. So the blue box in the top right hand corner is active users right now. So that's real time stats. So the reason I'm asking you all to visit my website is so that we can see the, the spike in page traffic there. There we go, four, five, going up. So if you're just bored at work and you have an extra monitor, you can just leave this up all day and kind of watch it. Sometimes it's fun where you just see random spikes in traffic throughout the day and you're like, where did that come from? Um, but that's always going. So in the background, you can have that up. Then you've got users, sessions, bounce rate, and session duration. There are a ton, ton of buzzwords in Google Analytics. A lot of them you probably heard. Some of them you might not know what they mean. If I say one in the rest of this talk and you're not sure what that means, please, please feel free to stop me. I'll try to explain what I think are some of the most important ones, but a lot of them I use all the time, so I forget that you might not know what it means. So when you scroll down into this next section here, oh, sorry, I should say that each one of these is actually a button you can click on. So this is users. That's a user is how many people, like in, unique people have come to your site. Next one is sessions. So a session is how many times people have been on the site. One user can have more than one session. So if uh, Bob Smith comes to my website six times, he is one user, but he had six sessions. So usually your session count should be higher than your user count. If it's not, that's a little weird. Um, bounce rate. So bounce rate is how many people come to a page or come to one page of your site and then from that page leave or bounce. So if your bounce rate is really high on a particular page, that means that page is where everybody is leaving your site and there's probably some sort of problem on that particular page. So that's an important metric. The next one is session duration. Session duration is how long people are staying on, a, on your website, on multiple pages, on one page, just in general. So from when they hit your site, every internal link that they travel around your site till when they bounce off your site, that's all a session, and the time of that is a session duration. Okay. Going down the page from there, we get traffic channel. So traffic channel is essentially um, where in generally general terms your traffic was coming from. So the first one that you see is organic search. So that's people who are searching for either a keyword that I rank for or the actual name of my business. Um, or the name of another beacon agency. I get uh, It's somewhat of a common name and there's lots of different companies that use the word beacon. So I get a lot of random traffic from people that probably aren't looking for me and that's okay. I don't discriminate. Um, next is direct. So that's somebody who actually types in beacon.agency in their browser and goes straight to my website. So everybody who just did that, thanks. You just increased my direct traffic. Appreciate it. Um, next is social. So that's anything coming from social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, um, the platform formerly known as Google Plus um, before it got orphaned again. <laughs> um, any of those platforms, that's considered social traffic. Next is referral. So referral is just what it sounds like, somebody else sending traffic your way. So if I go do a guest post on so-and-so's blog and they link back to my website and you click on the link on their website and that gets you back to my website, that was referral traffic. Same thing if you go to um, let's say the meetup.com event page and you click on the link to my website that's in my bio, same thing. That would be a referral from meetup.com. So that's what a referral is. And then everything else just gets grouped into other. Okay, questions on that? All right, next, how are, how are your active users trending over time? So this is essentially asking um, how often are people coming? How often are they coming back? Things like that. Um, Next one over here, excuse me. <clears throat> How well do you retain users? So 
I don't expect users to keep coming back to my site and reading my marketing page over and over and over again. Um, that person would probably be either really forgetful or just not understand that content the first time. Um, and we don't have really a blog to speak of, so there's no reason for people to be repeat offenders on my site. <clears throat> if I was running, like, let's see, WP Elevation or one of those sites that's a content membership site, I would really be concerned about this metric because I want people coming back to my site all the time. That's how I'm monetizing them. Uh, especially if I'm selling ad space on my site. If I have any sort of ad space, I want to make sure people are coming back to my site often so that I can retarget people and so that my traffic count is up. Right? So for me, people coming back to my site over and over and over again is sometimes cool. Usually it's like bot behavior or somebody who's trying to spam my site or trying to you know, crack a username or something like that. So when I see a lot of traffic coming back over and over again, it's usually a worrisome thing for me. For most people, it's not a problem. Um, next one, how, when do your users visit? So this is 12 a.m. to 10 p.m. The darker the color, the more people visit during that time. So this one right here, Wednesday, 4 a.m., 12 users, that's when I run all my analytics reports on a weekly basis. So all the bots come out, hang out in the morning at 4 a.m., and then they're gone before everybody shows up for work at 6. So that reads as traffic to Google Analytics, but it's actually just all bots crawling my site. Um, the 6 p.m. on Saturday one, I don't really have an explanation for that. Just a lot of people on Saturdays like to look at my site, I guess. Um, sessions by country. So the, again, darker the color, the more the people. So United States, which is where I do the majority of my business, that's you know what I would expect. Canada, there's actually a beacon agency in Canada that's a Women's Entrepreneur Institute. They do a lot of research for the Canadian government and they get tons of traffic from Twitter. Um, their Twitter handle is not at beacon agency, that's us. So I get all of their at tweets. So the Canadian Ministry of Interior is tweeting at us all the time and the um, Canadian um, Entrepreneurship Director of all these different organizations are always tweeting at us. And Again, thanks for the free traffic, appreciate it. Um, but Canada, we get a lot of people and it's usually in error. Um, sessions by device, so this is desktop versus mobile. Uh, as you would expect uh, on most sites, mobile is like usually like 90, 70 to 80% of your traffic. For me, it's desktop. A lot of people come to look at my site if they're thinking about hiring us because that's kind of a business decision. They tend to do it from a desktop because they're coming to check out our portfolio or something like that. So for us to see 77% desktop is not abnormal. Um, next one, pagers. What pages do your users visit? So where are they going most often? And this is in decreasing order. So the slash with empty is homepage. So that's just your index page, whatever that ends up being. And then it goes down from there. Um, I don't have any goals set up, so this is all empty. But if you had a contact form, some, like submission, or you had, uh, if it's an e-commerce site, like checkout or something like that, or <coughs> some sort of confirmation page um, that's an event, that would show up here as a goal completion. Uh, and that is the bottom of the home dashboard. Any question on any of those? So that's kind of like a high-level overview of pretty much everything that's going on on your site. And then from here, you can drill down into that stuff and see some more reports. One other thing I want to talk about just while we're looking at this is the difference between a dashboard and a report. So dashboards are meant to be like interactive and graphic representations of things. Reports are more like a snapshot in time. Usually they have filters, handles on them. So you can say, show me last 30 days if it's relative, or you can say, show me May 1 to May 31 or something like that. So reports are more like a, a snapshot in time based on filters where dashboards are more of like an interactive thing. Um, where it, the data is constantly updated in real time. So um, everything that you see under the next couple of groups here on the left side is going to be what's considered reports, where this is the only real true dashboard in Google Analytics. Um, you can plug Google Analytics into any number of business intelligence or business analytics tools and create really fancy dashboards. So that's actually one of the things that we do for customers is create all sorts of fun graphs and things like trend of channel sessions, last 15 days and fun stuff like that. So you can plug in a whole litany of other tools to create really fun and colorful graphic representations of data. Um, Google only does just a little bit of that sorry, on this page here. So then when we get into the reports, we basically have five groups here. We have real time, which again is like what's going on right now on your site. So if you're doing a live event or you just sent out a big email blast to 150,000 people or 
something is going on right now and you want to pay attention to what's happening on your site, that's where you would go. Audience is the next group. So that's who are the people that are coming to your site, who are your users, where you can learn more about them, who they are, their interests, what they do, things like that. Acquisition is traffic analysis. So where are they coming from? How are people getting to your site? How are you acquiring new users? Behavior is once they get to your site, once you've acquired them, what are they doing from there? Are they going to a second page and then a third page and then dropping? Are they dropping right off the home page? Do you have a high bounce rate? That's all considered behavior. And then conversions is where you set up things like goals, um, e-commerce conversions for checkouts, things like that. Essentially conversions, happen on a page load. So if you want to track a conversion on something like somebody submitting a contact form, you would have the contact form have a redirect that goes to a confirmation page. Just a, It could be something simple that's just like, hey, thanks for subscribing. We're going to send you a confirmation email. Um, while you're here, why don't you read this blog post? And that would be your confirmation page. So you would put the confirmation event on that page so that every time that page loads, you know you just got a new conversion. Does that make sense? So the conversion tracking actually happens on some sort of confirmation page, not on the page where the event happens. Okay. So in e-commerce, we do it on the checkout page. When you go to checkout, the last page that you get is the order confirmation page, and it says, thanks for checking out. Here's your order number. You, you're, you can expect your order to arrive in whatever such days. That page is where you put the checkout tracking tag. So that way we know that an order has actually been submitted to the system. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. <clears throat> All right, so real time is kind of self-explanatory. So unless anybody feels really strongly about wanting to learn about real time data, I'm going to skip over that one for right now. Basically, you've got overview. Where's your traffic coming from? What channels are they coming from? What content are they consuming? Um, <laughs> events. So that's, again, anytime somebody's submitting forms or checking out or whatever events you have set up there and conversions. Okay. So if you want to poke around in the real time stuff, that just shows you what's going on right now. I don't usually find that stuff too useful because a lot of what we're doing is based on an advertising campaign or like a paid email send or something like that where it's happening over four or five days. So I usually am running a report based on a time frame, not in real time. Um, there are certainly applications where real time analytics is useful. Like I said, live events, conferences, things like that. But um, for most small business customers, which is what we do, it's just not something that's very useful to them. Um, anybody want me to look at anything in real time before I skip it completely? Good? All right, cool. So let's look at audience. When you click on audience, it expands down and then you've got a bajillion more things to look at underneath here. So this is where it starts to get overwhelming quickly because you can kind of go down the rabbit hole and, and really get lost. So everything starts with an overview, which is kind of your crash course in your audience. Um, when we get into the reports, all the reports have a time constraint or time filter applied to them. So if you get to a report and you're like, oh my god, I only have five users, remember you're probably only looking at maybe five days of time. So first things first, go up here and pick a date range. Um, I'm using a custom one here, but you can say show me just today, yesterday, last week, last month, last seven, or last 30. If you want to see more than that, you can just pick a day, pick the end day, and then apply that. So now that's going to update, and now we have some more traffic to look at and more bumps and or uh, peaks and valleys on the chart. So at the top of most report pages, there's some sort of line bar or line chart that goes across here, which is something against time, uh, some measurement of that. And you can usually change this. So right now it's users. Um, there's session duration, bounce rate. So if you want to change this graph to see different things, you can customize that view. When you hit the save button up here, that gets saved as a customization in this view. So when we were talking earlier and we said you've got analytics accounts, you've got properties, which is websites, and then you've got views, every time you customize something in your view and hit save, it's saving it for that view only. So you could have, if you have, let's say, three or four people who are on your marketing team at your company and they all interact with analytics for different reasons, each one could have their own view saved in their property where they can make whatever customizations they want without it affecting yours, okay? So that's where a view kind of comes into play. Does that make sense? Cool. So anything you change here, if you update this, if I said new users and then I hit save again, that would become uh, a change to that. Um, you can segment, so I'm looking at all users now, but if I wanted to segment that down, I hit this button here, 
then I get all sorts of different custom uh, filters I can apply to see specific groups of people if I want to look at very specific traffic. For now, I'm just going to keep it general. So I have users, new users, number of sessions, sessions per user. Oops, excuse me. Let me go ahead and mute that. Um, page views, so every time a page loads. Um, so again, a session is when somebody visits your site until they leave your site. So one person in one session could have multiple page views. Um, so that number should be, again, higher than your sessions, which should be higher than your users. Um, pages per session, so how many pages in general does somebody visit before they bounce off the site? So I get four, which is pretty good. Um, most websites, it's one or two. You know, you have like the one click rule, which is where the really long homepage originally came from. People are only going to look at one page of your site to so put everything on the homepage. Don't do that. But for a long time, that was the trend. Um, and that's where that came from, was people realized that bounce rate was a thing. And a lot of people realized, well, most people only visit one page of your site. So let's put everything on that page. Um, average session duration is time on site. So from the minute they get there to the minute they leave, how long did they spend? And then bounce rate is how many people bounce right off the site after they hit a single page. No internal traffic follows. Okay. Then we get in some demos. So we've got language. Um, and when you select a tab over here on the left, it updates the chart over here. So the overwhelming majority of uh, my traffic is U.S. English followed by Great Britain English. Um, countries, probably the same. Yep, about what you would expect. Cities. Ashburn is Virginia, which is a lot of server traffic and bots and things like that. Um, New York, I have several customers there. Hemet, I don't even know what that is. Um, but you can actually click through these. Each one of these is a link that you can kind of go down the rabbit hole on. Um, browser, Chrome as you would expect, Safari, Mozilla, operating system, Windows, Mac, iOS, going down the list as usual. Service provider, so um, where do they get their internet? So. Facebook Ireland Limited sent 99 users to my page, which is interesting. So I don't know where that comes from, but for some reason, Facebook's been checking me out. Um, Amazon Technologies is probably Amazon Web Services, um, Comcast, Charter, AT&T, T-Mobile. So a lot of what you would expect. And then just specific to mobile, so operating system, service provider, and screen resolution. If you are into designing really high-end websites that need to look good on a lot of different devices, looking into things like screen resolution can be really interesting because you can find out that a lot of people are visiting that site that have some weird size. So like my top size for mobile is this like 375 and most of those people come from Apple devices. So looks like I do really well on those particular screens for whatever reason. And you can again, you can click through these and each time you click it takes you down the rabbit hole to another layer of data. Ooh. Is there a way to filter out bots and even attackers? Yes. So you can go into the settings and there's a place where you can exempt IPs. Um, what I always do is, the first thing I do is exempt my own IP so that all the times I'm reloading pages over and over again when my developers are making changes or we're working on the site, it's not loading that traffic each time. Um, same thing, anybody else on my team, I make sure we whitelist their IP. And then depending on what you're using for security plugins, like if you're using WordFence, you can get a report out of WordFence that'll show you malicious attempts on your site and what IPs they came from. And usually they come from a range. So you can put in like an IP range with a wildcard saying, if it's like this, you know, 10.0.0.1 something, whatever, and you see a lot of traffic from that IP, you just block that whole range and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. It won't show up as traffic in your site. Probably Facebook Ireland. Yeah, Facebook. Do you set up an uh, additional view, a raw view that has all your raw data so if you set up a filter and something gets fishy, you can only see? Uh, I'm really the only one that plays in the sandbox on my site for Google Analytics, so I don't. If it was, you know, if I was doing best practices, yeah, 100% I would. Um, it's always a good idea just to have one that hasn't been messed with, hasn't been filtered and sliced up, so you have like the original. Um, but it's always just me in there, so I just kind of break things. <laughs> I don't even know what's dinging. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, any other questions? All right, so 
A um, couple things in here I want to highlight. There's just not enough time for me to go through every single thing in every single report. So I want to show you like some of my favorite stuff. Demographics is always important. So one of the projects that we do a lot for businesses is like a, a brand guidelines project. And then we also do one that's like a communication strategy project. And in those projects, we talk a lot about audience, who your audience is, what tone of voice you should use with that audience, what demographics we know about that audience, what channels we should be communicating with that audience for content strategy. You can't really have intelligent conversations with your customers if you don't know who their audience is. And if you've ever had a conversation with a small business owner about their audience, they're like, well, I got Mike who comes in on Thursdays to get the special and I got, you know, like they're thinking about their regulars. They don't really understand that people who come to their restaurant, for example, fit a specific or not a specific, but at least a general mold of people. They fall in an income range. They fall in an age range. They're from <laughs> a certain set of neighborhoods or within so many miles of a zip code. So we do a lot of stuff with local businesses where it's trying to figure out who those people are. And a lot of the time, what we find out in Google Analytics directly contradicts what they think they knew about their customers. Um, if you don't have data, you're just guessing. And a lot of business owners can kind of get offended in this. And I, I've, I've learned I have to approach these conversations very delicately because they think that they're the expert on their customer. I've been doing this for 30 years. I know who these people are. I know what they need to see and I know what they need to hear from me. But then I go in here in Google Analytics, I'm like, well, did you know that you had 50 people on your site from three towns over that you never mentioned at all? Did you know that those people even came to your website and they were checking you out and they're like, what, what do you mean? Where do those people come from? So until you get it set up and you show them all the stuff that's going on in here, a lot of times business owners don't really know what they're missing out on as far as just the wealth of information they can find in here. Um, you know, if you start seeing, using the restaurant example again, if you start seeing a ton of people hitting the, you know, order site on Tuesday afternoons, or you see conversely like a huge dip in traffic on Wednesday afternoons for a restaurant that has a good lunch business, you might say, well, Wednesday is the day that the least amount of people are coming to the site. So that's probably the day that we need to run a lunch special promotion or something like that. So you can start to analyze the traffic and the behavior and see what people are doing and when and use that to make informed decisions with the business owner. So a lot of what I do is I sell reports <laughs> to people for a ton of money. Like it sometimes amazes me how much I can sell reports to people because what they're paying for is not the PDF that I send them once a month. It's my analysis of that report and what I can find in it. And so I love doing that. Like if, if I could just do that and not offer any other services, I think I would, but I just couldn't get enough clients that way. So we do everything else too. But like for me, the data mining is really like my favorite part. So um, offering that service has been really fun for me because I get to like do the thing that I really enjoy, which is like playing with reports all day. So a lot of what I'm doing for my clients is just setting up reports in our BI tool that run on a regular schedule once a month. They get emailed to me on, let's say the second, because it'll run it on the first for the previous 30 days or 31 days or whatever it is. And then I get that report emailed to me. I open that report up. I do my analysis on it. I make my notes. I set up a call with the customer. We review my highlights together. I present the action items for that month. And then that affects either content strategy, advertising strategy, social strategy, or whatever else. But it's all based on data that comes out of reports, a lot of which comes from Google Analytics, especially for e-commerce customers because all they care about is traffic and sales. So it's this constant game of trying to figure out where are they coming in and where are they going out? And if it's not the checkout confirmation page, then trying to fix it because that's where I want all the traffic to come in from all these different places, go through the funnel, get to the checkout page, put in the credit card information and then hit the confirmation page. Anything other than that is a problem and I have to figure out how to fix those holes where people are falling off. Make sense? Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Is there a way of batch exporting those data? Yep. So on every single page, there is a couple buttons up here. There's save. So again, if you make changes and you hit the save button, it will save that change to your view. Then there's export. So anytime you're looking at a report like this one here, you hit this export button, you have PDF, Google Sheets, Excel, or CSV. And it will just download that file or that information right there in whatever format you've asked for. So if you do PDF, a second to crunch. There's PDF. 
PDF. Open Sesame. Ta-da, PDF. Okay. Then if you do CSV, it's just the raw data essentially. Um, another thing that you can do is um, share. So if you go over here to share, this is actually a fun little pro tip. Put it in an email address and it can be yours. You can email yourself here. So if you wanna see your own website traffic report every Monday or you wanna see it on the first of every month for the last month, you can set that up to automatically email you right here. So you put in your address, you put in the subject for the email, you select the format, I recommend PDF. You pick the frequency, so I can say send me this daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Let's say I wanna see it monthly on the first day of the month, and then there's advanced options in here, how long this is gonna run for, and then I can put in a note. So if you're sending this to a client, you can actually put in a little customized message right here like, hey Jim, here's this month's report. Use this link to set up a meeting with me after you've had a chance to review it. Love it. And then hit the little I'm not a robot button and send, and that will set up that automation for you, okay? So if you wanna really impress your customers for free with very little effort of your own, you can set up automated Google Analytics reports that are gonna to send to them without any effort. So there you go. Free tool that you can use to upsell your hosting. Um, so demographics we mentioned, this is the overview. If you wanna look more at age and gender, you can click on those options over here and it gives you a more specific breakdown. You get your age groups over here, which you can then dive further down into and break that up to see more. Across the top of this, you get users, new users, sessions, bounce rates, pages per session, session duration, uh, things like that. Email newsletter signups, all the fun things that you can set up as goals and events all happen right there. Gender, same kind of thing. You can see the breakdown and then you can dive specifically into one gender or the other to look at more information. So again, for e-commerce, this can be really useful if you're selling a product that's marketed specifically to one gender or the other. One of my clients is a like high-end floral perfume, luxury brand. So for them, like we know that 98.7% of our audience is female. We also know there's a very small percentage of males that like our hand cream, and that's cool. Like we like those guys, but we're not gonna advertise to them because the majority of their peers don't like our product. So it's not worth it for us to run an ad that's gonna have a low relevancy score targeting that market when we can spend our money targeting the other 98% of our market that are all more or less around the same characteristics. So we can figure stuff like that out in here so that before we even get to making ads, we know what we're looking for, okay? Interests, this is a huge one. If you're trying to figure out what kind of content people wanna see, interests is where you need to go. So start an overview and you'll learn all kinds of interesting stuff. Again, remember you wanna set the time constraints here to be big. So if you're looking at the interest reports and you're trying to figure out like a content strategy, set this for like a year. So you get all the people who have been to your site for a while. That way you get a nice cross section of data points here. If you're only looking at a week, you can get really weird skewed data where it's like, wow, all these people are really interested in underwater basket weaving. I wonder why. It's because like one person came to your site four times and the data got skewed. So you get a couple things here in the overview. You get affinity category, in-market segment, and then other category. So affinity category is like something that they're interested in or have ex shown behaviors that sh like identify them as being interested in this thing. So lifestyle and hobbies, business professionals. It would make sense that business professionals are visiting my marketing website, right? They're coming to check us out. That makes sense. Value shoppers. I don't know why those people are coming, but I know that people who visit my site like a deal. So that means that I should probably be attention to things like promotions and coupons and things like that. They're technophiles. They really like technology. So talking to people about devices, asking them if they've had problems with their new iPad or did you hear about this new thing that just came out? Probably a good conversation starter when I'm talking to new prospects. Um, oh, speaking of, if you know that you have a pitch meeting coming up, real-time traffic can be a really useful thing. Because what do most people do right before a pitch meeting? They jump on your website and they check you out because they forgot to do it beforehand, right? So if you look at the traffic for the day of or real-time traffic for an hour before your pitch meeting, I guarantee you you can learn something interesting about the people that are gonna be in that room. Because if you just narrow it down to just that day, and then you jump over here to affinity categories, you're like, oh, this guy's interested in fishing, that guy's interested in football, and you can learn all of that right here for free. 
Um, all right, so affinity category is what they're interested in. In market segment, these are people who have shown a behavior that signifies they are going to make a purchase in a market segment. So advertising and marketing services is number one. Weird, right? People who are going to make a purchase in advertising or marketing services are visiting my marketing and advertising website. Who would have thunk, right? Employment. A lot of people come looking for job for us for whatever reason. We're rarely hiring. Uh, and even when I do hire, it's for a job that I didn't know was going to exist. So it just happens usually. So we rarely post jobs. But for some reason, a lot of people who are looking for a job come visit us on a regular basis. Travel hotels and accommodations. Um, I can't really explain that one. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, software business and productivity. Or uh, excuse me. Software is the category. The subcategory is business and productivity software. I'm real big in productivity. I've spoken on productivity and productivity apps and written articles and things about it before. So that, again, doesn't surprise me. Um, also, that's kind of our whole shtick with my agency. Everything's online and it's like using technology to be as efficient as possible. So we attract that people because that's the type of people that we are and those are the clients we're looking for. So that, again, makes me smile a little bit on the inside. <laughs> Um, and then other categories down here. I'm not really sure what other category means. This will probably tell me, actually. Oh yeah, so people that are involved on social networks, that's another one that's not really surprising. Celebrity entertainment news, um, dictionaries and encyclopedias, that's fun. So I'm not sure what other is and why that's separate, but there's other stuff in there. Uh, questions on interests, that's a good one. Like I said, if you're looking at content strategies, definitely poke around in there. Geo is where they're located. For me, I only really do business in the United States and a little itty bit in Canada, so I'm not really concerned about this. I expect most of my traffic to be from the US, but if you're publishing and you want people from all over the world interacting with your site, it might be really important to you um, to look at this often. Um, language. This is something to take a look at, especially if you do websites for any sort of public institution, uh, higher ed or things like that. You might be getting users coming to your site who speak a language that you don't offer as a translation. So um, you would I'd be able to figure that out from in here because if you see all of a sudden like a huge spike in traffic that's speaking Swahili or speaking Dutch or something, you'd be like, wow, we probably should take a look into this. Maybe there's a lot of people who are trying to learn about us, whether it's a company or a business or whatever, um, that speak this language. Um, I started to see a spike in people who spoke Polish and then I got an email submitted through a contact form that there was a Polish company that was looking for us to do an audit of their US facing website because they think there was problems with their English. I was like, oh wow, that makes sense now. Like there actually were a bunch of people in Poland looking at us. So um, you can learn interesting stuff in here. Um, behavior, I think behavior is one of my favorites for sure. Acquisition, we're gonna show a couple that I really like too. So. First one with behavior is new versus returning. So if I wanna learn just about the behavior of my new visitors, again, I can click through in here and just see how they behave. If you are just looking at people who come back a lot, um, that would be your returning visitors. So again, for my site, not really as important, but I do this one a lot on my customer sites because we want repeat shoppers, especially like I do a lot of work in uh, health and beauty. So e-commerce for health and beauty, we want people coming back to fill up their makeup supplies and things like that on a regular basis every 30 days. So seeing the behavior of my frequent users, those are my loyal customers. So like learning about that behavior shows me more insight about what I can do to increase lifetime customer revenue versus the new or non-returning visitor behavior, which is more about, okay, so these people came to my site and it wasn't what they were looking for. Where did they come from? Where did they go? That shows me where I went wrong here. Does that make sense? So if you separate those two groups out, you can learn more about like returning visitors are usually either your customers or your subscribers or people who interact with you regularly. And they have a behavior that usually fits a pattern versus people who are not, the people who just bounce off your site, following those people and looking into their behavior will show you where you're going wrong with either attracting people to your site, tracking your users, or where your content is not serving them correctly and they're bouncing off, yeah? Uh, frequency and recency, so number of sessions and then how often they're coming back. 
Um, you can split this off here and see days since last session too. Um, so if this number down here is really high, then people are like coming back to you once a year. That would be kind of strange. Um, if you're a blog, this might be an important metric for you to track how many people are coming back to read my blog on a weekly basis as I publish, or are they only coming back like once a month or once every two months? You can see that in here. Um, Technology will show you the devices they're using. Mobile will show you more about specifically your mobile traffic. If you are a very mobile heavy business, uh, you get a lot of mobile traffic and you need to convert that traffic. It's really important that you look at that separately and do your analytics separately for mobile um, because you can find a lot of interesting things on the way people interact with your device on a phone. Touch screens are a completely different user experience than a trackpad or a mouse. And a lot of times we forget that and we forget that maybe a pop-up that looks really good on desktop is totally getting in the way on mobile and causing a terrible user experience. So it's a worthwhile thing to look at just your mobile traffic and see like, okay, I found this really interesting bounce rate that's happening on this page here. But if I look at mobile, that bounce rate goes up 50% higher. Then there's something going on on the mobile rendering of that page that's causing more people to bounce. So looking at that mobile traffic specifically can show you really interesting things about the responsiveness of your site. Okay. Um, that's it for audience. Any questions on any of that before I move on? Anybody cross device? Completely lost. Oh, cross device? So, um, I'm not entirely sure how this is happening, but Google is setting up tracking now where cookies can be applied to a Google's user account anonymously so that they're not violating privacy laws. So if I'm, so for example, like you can see, I'm logged in in Chrome up here, right? I'm logged into Google down here. I'm logged into Google on my phone. I'm logged into Chrome on my phone. I'm logged into Gmail on my phone, all four of my Gmail accounts on my phone. And Google knows that, right? It knows all the places that I'm signed in and it's tracking my browsing history in all those places. So like if I go to my browser history in Chrome right now, I see it by device for everything that I own. So Google is now playing around with this idea of cross-platform tracking so that if somebody is... So here's an example of where this could be really useful. Let's say you're running an ad on Facebook for a physical product that you're selling on an e-commerce store. And what happens often is that people see an ad and they go to check out, but maybe the checkout process is laborious and they don't want to put in their credit card details on their mobile device. So they come back to that website again later from a desktop so that they have the keyboard and they can type more easily. Or maybe they're looking at that ad while they're at work on their phone, but they want to come back to that offer when they can check out without their coworker seeing them at home later. All right, so that could be an example of where cross-platform tracking for a user could be really useful because you could say, wow, people are seeing this ad on mobile. They're interacting with this ad. They're not finishing the checkout process and converting, but then they're coming back a day later or six hours later or eight hours later and they are converting on desktop. Then you can do traffic analysis on that and you can retarget them with different ads <laughs> or you could send an email automation based on when they saw the Facebook ad. You could start to automate an email sending to them six hours later or eight hours later or whatever. So there's all kinds of fun stuff you could do once you know that information. But essentially it's Google's new project where they're trying to figure out how they can use this to sell more ad space essentially. Because if we can track them from one device to another, that's not a unique user on both platforms anymore. That means we can remarket to them better. We can target them better. We know their relevancy score already. We don't show them the same ad twice on two different devices, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? It's only what you have to do with advertising. That, that's why it's blank there because you're not doing any advertising. Um, let's see. It's also in beta, so it might not work. <laughs> And I, I might just not have any users where it's tracked them across m multiple devices yet. Um, let me see. Yeah, not enough data to generate. That's my problem. See down here, this error message. So there's just not enough traffic on my site. If I went to some of my customer sites that get way, way more traffic than mine, that stuff would probably populate. 
I think it's especially common on e-commerce sites and on sites where people consume your content multiple times. Like for example, if you have a cooking blog and you have recipes, people might see your recipe on Pinterest and save it on their mobile device, but then come back and keep accessing it from their tablet in the kitchen where they're using that recipe. Like that would be another example of cross device tracking. So you can see, okay, this person came to us from here, but they're using it here. Right? All right. Um, Acquisition, Tom, how am I doing? I'm like way over time, right? Yeah, you got like five, minutes. five minutes. All right. Um, let me do this. So in acquisition, all traffic, a couple of cool things here. Channels is the first one. So channels are your marketing channels. Where did people come from? And you can see how those people perform on your site by channel. People who come from social tend to be more engaged usually. People who come from organic search usually tend to be more engaged. Usually I see the worst engagement from people who are paid traffic, so coming from ads, especially if those ads are not good. Um, if the relevancy score of the ads is bad, people are clicking through and they're getting there and they're just bouncing off the page because it's not what they expected. So you can see by traffic type how people are performing on your site. And then you can sort it. So I can say, like, I want to see who has the worst bounce rate. So if I click on the bounce rate column, direct has a bounce rate of 1.98%. And so I can see that's the worst one. Or if I click it again, it'll invert that and shows me the best one, okay? So that's a good one to pay attention to. Again, you can click through on any of these and do further analysis just on that particular segment of the group. Tree maps, this is a fun one. This, this one gets so complicated, there's actually a video to explain it. But essentially, you've got a tree here showing primary metric versus secondary metric. And this can get really confusing, but right now I'm looking at number of users versus number of pages per session. And again, this is all within ch channels here. So I can see organic search, social search, direct search, then referrals. And it creates this weird box. The bigger the box is, the more traffic you're getting. So for me, there's only like five channels here, so it's kind of a weird looking like puzzle thing. But if you had a boatload of different sources of traffic, there would be all these different blocks and it shows you the bigger the block, the more people are coming from that. So it's just a graphic way of showing you that. Down here though, we get into the group channels. If I click through on organic search, then I could see more specifically like where they're coming from and what they're searching for and things like that. So um, Beacon Agency Books, we've never made a book. People are searching for that for some reason. So like you can just keep continuing to click through. Um, source medium over here, really fun as well. You can see where people are coming from, referral traffic, um, you know, websites that we've made. We always put a little link in the footer. I get referral traffic from those all the time. So that's always fun to see where people are clicking in from. Um, if you're running Google ads, there's specific analytics you can set up here. You need to turn this module on. So just click in here once and it'll say, do you want to enable this? Click yes. Um, Search Console, that's another product that Google makes that you should be using if you're not, if you manage websites especially. Search Console is your reporting mechanism for how Google's bots are interacting with your site. So when they have problems, it'll tell you in Search Console. You can connect that in here and get more useful information from Search Console about where people are landing on your sites, countries, devices, queries that they're putting in. So set up a, Google, a free webmaster account with Google, set up Google Search Console, verify your site, and then in Google Search Console settings, you can connect other apps, connect it to analytics, and then you get all these reports here. So it shares data back and forth. Same thing if you're running ads for a client, or even if the client's just running ads on their own, connect the ad account to the analytics account as well so that you get that data shared there. All right, I'm gonna skip out of acquisition and go to behavior because I wanna show you my all-time favorite, so behavior flow. This is where I get lost often. So behavior flow shows you literally the path that people are taking as they move through your site. As we go from the left to the right of this report, you're looking at clicks on the site. So you can pick your first dimension that you want to view here. So you can see people that came from each campaign that you're running, people that are coming from each medium, people that are coming from referral sources, whatever you want. So I'm going to do medium for now. So of the organic traffic that came to my site, the next row are all the pages that they hit based on where these gray lines go. So you see the majority of that gray line goes straight across to my home page. And then there's a little small gray line down here, which goes to our about page. 
but essentially all of our organic traffic is hitting one of two pages right now, home or about, okay? So I'm willing to bet if I look at my Google SERP right now, those are gonna probably be the two pages that Google has indexed and put as like sub, uh, sub results underneath my main website, okay? Um, none just means that it wasn't able to be tracked, meaning that Google doesn't know what the medium was. And then referral is all of those other things, usually like social media, websites, blogs, other websites, um, things like that. When you get into the first level here, you see this red block. This is drop-offs. So as you hover over this, you can see 561 people got to this page. And then from there, 487 dropped off right off that page. Of the people who continued on... They hit all the pages that this little gray line touches. So we've got the about page, the advertising page, the marketing page, back to the home page again, portfolio sections, and then there's eight other pages which you can view a breakdown. <laughs> so I'm not going to go too far into this, especially because I'm out of time, but essentially this is the map that shows you the path people are taking through your website. And if you only see one layer here, then that's a big problem because you're not giving people options of where to go as they continue through the journey of your site. Like you hear the buzzword all the time, user journeys or customer journey. This is it right here. Like Google's literally giving you a map of where people are going. And if you have an ideal customer journey in your mind for your site or your customer's site, and it doesn't line up with this, what you're seeing here, then you have a really big problem because people are not able to follow the path that you want them to follow. Does that make sense? Cool. One last thing. There's a really good mobile app for Google Analytics too. Um, I can't speak to the Apple one, but the Android one's pretty solid. It doesn't allow you to do everything. So if you're really trying to slice and dice or create reports, get on desktop. But if you've got pre-created saved views that you just want to look at from time to time, the mobile app's really great for that. It's also really great for switching between multiple accounts. Okay. Any questions? Um, I want to go back to the triggers. Yeah. You said um, if they hit a contact form, Correct, yeah, because Google Analytics is based on a page right. load. So you can't do a trigger on the submit form, on the submit button of the contact form. You could. Wouldn't that be a good way to go? Yeah, you could do it as a click on that. Yeah. For me, it's usually easier to implement to do it on a confirmation page. Um, I always use, anytime somebody takes an action, I always want to redirect them to something anyways. Um, if they submit a contact form, I always want it to say at least thank you and this is when you can expect a response. Um, if it's um, a cart checkout, there should always be like a, hey, thanks for your order, um, and then either an upsell or try and get them to subscribe to the newsletter or something like that. So just as a best practice kind of thing, we're almost always doing a redirect anyways, so adding the tracking form. Contact form, just put your email sent successfully on yep. the same page. Yep. You could do that, yeah. Yep. So you could do it either way, I guess. Our personal preference is just to do it on a confirmation page. Yes, ma'am? Um, so, one thing I end up trying to do a lot unsuccessfully, and I thought maybe you might have a solution to this, is when I'm um, brought in to do a new website for someone, mm -hmm. I want to look at their analytics on the website <coughs> so I can see what's been active, what hasn't been active. We do the exact same thing every time we begin a relationship. So. Um, so, a lot of times, if their site was created by somebody else, that somebody else went and created the property and analytics. And never gave my client admin privileges. Yeah, I've so run into that before too. So how do you get too. access to your own property? Because I can now can put a new tag on, but then I don't get historical data. Correct. Yeah. So you can open a support ticket with Google to get access if the person is incommunicado. Um, and it's easy to prove access because if you have access to the DNS or you have access to the file structure, you can put on whatever verification tag that they want to do that. It's kind of a pain because, you know, Getting support from Google is like getting support from Facebook. Good luck. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, just and as a best practice, if you're doing this for clients, please, please, please don't ever put tag manager accounts or analytics accounts under your own Gmail. Have the client create the account, provide you access to the account, and then set it up for them, right? So all you have to do, there's again, millions of places that you can find. Just do a Google search, how to set up Tag Manager, and there are instructions that somebody else has written you can send to your client. But once they go in here and they just, all they have to do is create the account. Don't do anything else. Then once the account is created, they just go to admin, 
and then they go to user management right here for the account and then they just add you there okay that's all they have to do once you're added as an admin there you can take care of everything else for them but just please as a best practice if you're doing this for clients please don't put it under your account because you're making it really hard for the next guy which is essentially what I think you're talking about yeah yeah so I, I there's no silver bullet way to fix that problem when it comes up Really, I just try really hard to get in touch with that person and try to get them to play nice, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes that email address doesn't exist anymore. Sometimes they don't have access to it. So then you just, just case by case, you have to deal with it. But yeah, that's really the best I have for you. That's what I thought. I just, I didn't know if I was, if it was like some backdoor. Yeah, no, none that I'm aware of. But if you find it, please let me know. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, last question. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. So multilingual is a great use case for multiple segments. Um, you might have uh, a site that's got WordPress multilanguage set up on it and you have two different audiences, one that's in English and one that's in Spanish and they may behave completely different. And if you're doing a setup where you have multiple languages on the site, maybe there's a problem the way that one of those is implemented. And you're going to find that sometimes in the analytics when you look at a specific segment. So you look at your general traffic and you're like, wow, our page bounces are up a little bit. But then you look at just the Spanish segment, you're like, wow, these page bounces are up a ton. That's where your problem lies. So yeah, there's lots of times where getting into one specific segment can show you something that like just really shines a spotlight on a problem on your site. I didn't do too much of that in this because I tried to you know keep it surface level just because of timing. Sorry, Tom. Um, but yes, there's tons of stuff that I've found digging into very specific small chunks of traffic where all the people that are in that group behave exactly the same. And I'm like, why is that? And it'll drive me crazy until I can figure it out. But once I do, great example of that, we did a paid campaign for one of my clients, it's the, the <laughs> fragrance people I talked about earlier. They paid an absorbent sum of money to send 150,000 emails out to a paid list. So people that had double opted into this list to get deals. We're sending them a deal. What they decided they wanted to do is send a campaign that was asking them to subscribe to their newsletter in exchange for a free sample of the hand cream that they sell. So we specifically targeted people from this massive list of paid subscribers that had previous um, charitable donations because this company donates the majority of its proceeds to charity. And we said, hey, you're charitable. We're charitable. It's a match made in heaven. Why don't you subscribe to our newsletter? And because we're so nice, we're going to send you this free thing too. And we created this killer funnel with a landing page and a subscription form that puts them into a MailChimp list and automates a response to send them a coupon code. And then once they subscribe, they get two buttons that they can choose, one to check out now and one to go do more shopping with 15% off and cart URL redirects and all the fun stuff. Like we connected this thing and tested it within an inch of its life. And then the day came, they sent out the email, 150,000 people got the email, 6,000 people clicked the link, 1,300 people got to the site and one person converted. And I went, shit, something here is really fun. <laughs> and I couldn't figure it out. And so I kept going and I kept going. And the thing that was driving me crazy was the analytics we got from the people said that 6,300 something people clicked the link. But when I look at the medium or the source traffic, I only see about 1,600 people coming from InfoStats, which is their, their server or whatever that was doing the tracking. So how are they getting 6,000 clicks and I'm only getting 1,300 clicks over here? And that was the thing that I couldn't figure out and it kept bugging me, kept bugging me, kept bugging me. And finally, it dawned on me that something that we should have tested and we didn't and it was our fault was page speed. 6,000 people clicked the link, but 5,000 of those people were too impatient for that page to load. And Google only tracks page loads on a complete load of the page. So if 6,000 people click a link, but only 1,000, 1,300 people of those show up in Google Analytics, 5,000 people were too impatient and your site's too slow. And that was the one thing that we didn't test in this funnel before we put it all together and sent it to this extremely expensive list of people. So it was a time where it's like, wow. And that was us. Like I had to tell the client, like that was our fault. And thank God that vendor and us have a good relationship and they sent another email for us for free <laughs> to kind of save our tuckets because it was, it was on us. But that was a time where Google Analytics in several hours of bashing my head against the monitor, I finally figured it out. I was like, oh, it's right there in front of me. The reason why those people never got here is because it was too slow. 
So that's my story. Any other questions? Uh, well, if there's any other questions, see me outside because Tom's going to kill me. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Again, uh, at the Ed Perry on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to holler at me, if you have questions, you can also send a contact form through my website or ed at beaconagency.net. Feel free to email me questions anytime. Also, next month I'm speaking at WordPress Rhode Island. So I don't know what I'm talking about yet, but it's going to be awesome. So you should totally go. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Have a great night. Drive safe. <laughs>